Only a few decades ago, hitchhiking was common practice amongst those who didn't own a vehicle. And it wasn't strange to see people thumbing rides near truck stops and on highways. Today, it's considered too dangerous as ever more hitchhikers disappear from the roads, never to be seen or heard from again. Number 5 Jojo Dullard, a 21-year-old woman, moved home to Callan in Ireland after finding a full-time job as a waitress at Granger's Cafe. She'd been studying towards becoming a beauty therapist in Dublin, but when the opportunity for immediate employment came along, she moved back home to start her new job the following Monday, November 13, 1995. On the 9th of November, however, Jojo had traveled back to Dublin by bus at around 8.30 a.m. where she collected her last welfare check from a post office. Upon leaving the office, she went to a bar where she met up with some friends and they spent the afternoon catching up. At around 10 p.m., Jojo left the bar and headed to the bus station where she was supposed to catch the last bus back to Callan. To her dismay, she found that she'd missed the bus and decided instead to catch a bus to Nas, a town 65 miles from Callan. Her plan was to hitch a ride from home to Nas, and after arriving at 10.50 p.m., she was picked up by a motorist. She was then dropped off at the side of the motorway in Kilcullen, with another 57 miles to go before reaching home. She managed to hitch another ride almost immediately as she was picked up again at 10.15 p.m. and was taken as far as Moon Village, still 47 miles from Callan. At 11.37, she made a call from a payphone to her friend Mary informing her that she'd missed the last bus, but that she was hitchhiking her way home. During their conversation, Jojo went silent for a few minutes, presumably having flagged down another car. She told Mary that a car had stopped and that she would phone her again from her next stop. When she didn't arrive home the following day, her family immediately knew that something was wrong. She was very close with her siblings, and would always keep in contact with them, no matter where she was. The only information that was found after Jojo's disappearance was that a woman, fitting her description, was seen leaning into the window of a dark-colored Toyota Carina. Despite the lack of evidence, it's now believed that foul play was involved, and Jojo's case has now been upgraded to a murder investigation. Number 4 In 2017, David O'Sullivan from Middleton, Ireland was a 25-year-old man who traveled to the Pacific Crest Trail in California from the border of Mexico where he undertook a 2,650-mile journey to Washington, which would have taken approximately five months to complete. He decided to tackle the trek after reading the book Wild by Cheryl Strait, and he told his family that they would not have regular contact with him and warned that they may not hear from him for weeks at a time. Though he wasn't a very experienced hiker, David felt confident that he would be able to traverse the national forest and protected wilderness and described it as the trip of a lifetime. He started his journey on March 22nd, heading out from Campo San Diego after choosing the trail name Leprechaun. Another hiker who was on the same trail as David described having lunch with him in the Paradise Valley Cafe, about a mile off the trail. David told him he'd lost his sun hat a few days prior and he said that David's lips were cracked and his skin was peeling, but he seemed in good spirits. After leaving the cafe, he saw David hitching a ride from the cafe to the trail, remembering 
that he felt jealous as he would have to walk the mile or so back. Two and a half weeks into his journey, David arrived in the town of Idlewild on April 5th and spent the night at a local hotel at the foot of the San Jacinto Mountain. While staying there, he did some chores and contacted his friends and family via Facebook, telling them that everything was going well and that he would be setting out once again on the 7th. He also mentioned that he'd ordered a replacement adapter which was intended for his Kindle and that he considered waiting for it to arrive before continuing, though it would have interfered with his schedule. The adapter was never picked up, eventually making its way back to the cellar, and David has been missing ever since. Due to his schedule, he was not reported missing for three months, by which time searchers had no idea where to even look for him. Number 3 In mid-July 2009, 20-year-old Emil Petrov from Finland decided to go on an adventure by traveling across Europe alone. At the time, he was in Sweden and he left a letter to his family explaining that he had to go but he would return before autumn. Two weeks later, he emailed his family to report that he had made it to Germany and on the 2nd of August, they received another letter to say that he was in Italy and that he had some surprises to bring home. He reiterated that he would be back by autumn and his family says he sounded very busy and glad to be on the road. The next contact from Emil was on the 16th of August, again via email, when he told them that he was still in Italy but that he'd traveled to Brindisi and that he would be traveling eastward. In this email, he apologized for leaving so abruptly again but he seemed to be happy to be traveling. On the 29th of August, he reported that he was in Odessa in the Ukraine and that he was working on a project. He added that it was tough on the streets there but that he hoped to start heading home during the following month. He was learning to speak a little Russian and told them that he would tell them all about his projects when he was home. On the 19th of September, he said that he was looking for a small blind black cat and that he was stuck in a controversial situation that he would explain later. Six days later, he phoned his mother and told her that some people who were working with the homeless had become worried about him and took him to a Finnish man who offered him a place to stay and lent him money for a plane ticket home. They decided that he would indeed buy the ticket but the next day, he emailed again saying that he had changed his mind and would find another way home, probably passing through Stockholm to meet up with his sister before traveling back to Finland. Emil stayed with the Finnish family over that weekend and they would later tell his family that he'd been sleeping on beaches and in caves while traveling. Emil then left Odessa on the 27th of September via a night bus and he arrived at 7.10 a.m. Interpol found out some time later that he'd crossed the Ukraine-Polish border on the morning of the 1st of October. That same day, he'd emailed again to say that he was in Warsaw and hoped to make it home by the 8th of October. He also wrote to the Finnish family to say that he'd learned some hard lessons and that his life had been turned upside down, but he was never heard from again. Number 2 Jenny Chen, a curious woman who loved to experience new things, was a Chinese citizen who moved to the US in 2013. She met her husband, Jonathan Raynard, while he was in China and the couple married in 2012, after which she relocated to Seattle. In March of 2016, she traveled to Mexico where she intended to hitchhike across the country. She and Jonathan had planned to meet up again in Cancun on the 15th of April to hike and go to the beach before traveling home together where she was to start graduate school on the 4th of July. 
After reaching Mexico, Jenny hitched from town to town, finding places to stay overnight via the Couchsurfing.com social network, which allows travelers to find host homes where they can sleep over before continuing on their way. As her travels continued, she regularly posted photos to Facebook saying that she was having a great time. When she didn't arrive to meet up with Jonathan as planned, he contacted an investigator who tracked her movements approximately six hours away. They also managed to find a family that she stayed with for one night, but they couldn't provide any helpful information. Witnesses described seeing Jenny where she was hitchhiking towards Cancun. Another witness stated that they saw Jenny being picked up by a driver of a Corona truck who then proceeded to drive in the opposite direction of Cancun. This was the last trace of Jenny that was ever found. Jonathan has expressed his frustration with the attitude of the authorities in Mexico and he says that they've been very little help. Her whereabouts remain unknown. Number 1 Between the cities of Prince George and Prince Rupert in British Columbia, Canada, lays a 450-mile stretch of highway that's been dubbed the Highway of Tears. It earned this name due to the high number of indigenous women who've gone missing or have been found murdered in this area, with the total number of victims being tallied at over 40. Tamara Chipman was one of these women. In 2005, the 22-year-old had a long history of hitchhiking and she was known as a strong, independent woman who knew how to look after herself. She had a keen love of the outdoors and had on several occasions made the trip from Prince Rupert to Terrace, a 91-mile journey that would see her disappear forever. On September 21st, Tamara set out on her trip and headed to Highway 16, where she attempted to hitch a ride. Several witnesses claimed to have seen her on the road that afternoon, but no one saw her getting picked up. Other witnesses say that they saw her outside of an industrial park where truckers are known to take on passengers. This was a common means of transportation, not only for Tamara, but many hitchhikers in the area. A week later, after her family had not heard from her, they started looking for her, but to no avail. After their failed attempts, they contacted police who sent out only a single search party to the area. They refused to increase the size of the search party, and after nothing turning up during the initial search, they considered the case closed. Tamara's family suspect that she may have met with foul play though no evidence of this has ever been found. None of her personal belongings have been found either, and no further sightings have been reported. Many people theorize that she was the victim of a serial killer that was operating in the area, which would explain many of the other disappearances and deaths that have occurred there. Others think that a drug deal may have gone wrong or that she simply left home to start a new life by herself. Whatever the case may be, Tamara remains missing as just another victim of the Highway of Tears. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you like this video, be sure to click that like button. Also, don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell to keep up to date with all of our future uploads but I've been Ty Knotts and I'll catch you guys in the next video.